जय बाबा After Baba left Avatar's abode, Francis went back to continuing to write Stay With God. He'd started at our house in Bondi in August 56 and was still working on it. But by the time I got to the, uh, after Baba left, he was actually in the process of <coughs> corrections, going through, changing, checking, and Lorna used to come up whenever she had the time and see if there was any typing. One day in November 1958, she came up and as usual, Francis welcomed her, got out of his chair, he had a, a table just there, and his chair that he used all the time he was here until he went to India was Baba's commode chair with a piece of masonite, as is in Baba's room. And he always used to sit Lorna on that, put the typewriter in front of her and show her what was to be typed. This time he told her to sit down and said, I'll make a cup of tea. Now, after tea was made, he said, uh, he said, well dear, there's no more typing. I've done all I can. I can't think of anything else. The book is finished. Well, it's, to, to the best of my ability, it'll have to stand or fall the way it is. So about a month later, Francis got a letter from Baba saying, which he'd been warned about, that Baba was asking him to come and stay with the Mandali. We all thought, well, if he's lucky three months, if he's extra lucky six months, even Francis knew that it would be four, it would be more than his usual two weeks or a month as in 1955. So Francis was very happy to go off with his finished book. But when he got to India, Baba stuck his finger in the book's pie and started to make corrections to Francis' script, tell him uh, different changes he wanted, uh, dictating three discourses to be included in the body of the work, and then the big job, he asked Francis to write notes for all the references that were in the book that people may not know. So he asked me to, uh, he would send a little list, right, and he asked me to rope in Joanna to help. But I was farming at the time, so I think Joanna did about three quarters of the research, so that could be in, in that book. Uh, when the book was published, then one of Francis's jobs was, Bar uh, Barber wanted this book announced throughout the world, and so anyone who knew, like for example Francis, to write to everyone he knew, say in America, or Australia, or anywhere. Barbara asked for 5,000 copies, hardback. It's interesting, about four years ago, uh, the Australian literati got very excited. It was the 10th anniversary. An Australian poet, I can't remember his name, uh, had written a long poem a book-length poem, and it had sold 2,000 copies. Mm -hmm. Well, the hardback edition of Stay With God sold uh, 5,000 copies. In 74, mm -hmm. there was a paperback edition of 3,000 copies. And in the 90s, there was another edition with illustrations by John Parry. What was that edition? 4,000 plus 500 in hardback for America. So, that fellow's lost the race. <laughs> um, <clears throat> then, at the same time, Francis, <laughs> Baba was getting Francis uh, to take, uh, Indians were giving talks about Baba in India to Indians. And they have a tendency to go on and on and on. Right? 
Uh, it might be exciting for people in the audience, but to be printed in a newspaper or magazine, in cold print, Francis said, you know. So, so Barber gave him the job of making it printable. And uh, he also started, and he worked from 1959 to 1960, on five long poems, uh, including the ballad we heard the other night, sung by was that fellow Jacob? Very, very nicely too. Um, uh, uh, of a Ballad of the Rhyming Night. Ballad of the Rhyming Night, yes. And what's the other five in Word of Wells End? Dream of Wet Pavements. Right, that's it. Dream of Wet Pavements and and the one first one, whatever that was. Uh, Ballad of the Rhyming Night. Eh? Elegy for Young Poets. Elegy for the Young Poets, yep. Dream of Wet Pavements was the first <laughs> one. But he was writing others at the same time. And uh, so he, he worked on that 1959 to 1960. But he hadn't finished them when he started on a new venture. In 1961, early in 1961, he decided to invent or try to invent an English form of the guzzle. I'll come to that in a minute. Here's a letter he wrote in July of 1959. Just to give you an idea of what it was like to be a member of Barber's Mundali. The other day, according to Hindu calendar, was Guru's Day, which occurs once a year. Baba had us all collectively pray to God to help us to hold on to Baba to the end. Baba is not a guru in the sense that he teaches us. He has said, I come not to teach but to awaken. What he is, <coughs> is our guru in the sense that he takes over the direction of our lives according to the degree of our surrenderance of our lives to him. Thus, he is at the same time our personal guru and avatar to the whole creation. In the evening, he sent for me to come to his room and among other things said, your stay with me so far has been entirely fruitful for me for you and for your group. This your rather surprised me, as I've always felt since 56, when you all met him, that there was now no longer any group, but that each one was under his own steam. The point that makes me happy is that somehow my being with Baba has been of benefit to all because I always feel that the final fruit of anything he does for an individual will be when all enjoy it. Even when I have seen him giving the, bless the blessing of his embrace to thousands, I have not been able not to think, well, what about the millions? The answer apparently is that through the thousands, he does touch the millions. And this touch is a preparation for when he breaks his silence and manifests his full divinity. Now the assumption that I made from this, and I think Francis all agreed to it once, was that Harry Kenmore, even if Baba was in seclusion, had the right to turn up. And he would turn up without announcement. He would just turn up. <clears throat> and invariably, Francis got the job of looking after Harry. Harry wasn't very tall, but he was very stocky. I think I said in my book, he's, he was built like a bear, big man. And it might have been because of his blindness, and so therefore he couldn't judge where people were. He always spoke in a loud, strong voice. <laughs> anyway, Francis' job was to look after him. And he would be his minder, being blind, which meant a lot of 
tiddling things that had to be done for Harry, this found and that. One day Barbara said to Francis, he said, uh, he said, uh, <clears throat> take Harry into a, a cafe in a town and give him a good meal. Because he was eating Mundaly food, which was basically rice and a few vegetables and dal. So they're in this crowded Indian cafe. And the first thing Harry wanted was japatis. So the, bloke, the waiter brought the japatis and Harry could start on that. Francis shifted it, so Harry would put out a hand, get a chapati, and start munching away. And then, and then the waiter brought the first dish, first couple of dishes of their meals. And he moved, <laughs> he moved, moved the chapati. And Harry and Francis are talking, Harry puts out, Japatis! Japatis! And the whole restaurant goes, what's going on? What's going on? <laughs> Francis leapt up, grabbed the, here, 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 to quieten him down. <coughs> anyway, one of the things that happened in one of those trips was, Harry persuaded Francis to read the whole of East-West Gathering for his tape recorder. And when Francis wrote and told me this has happened, this has occurred, I said, did you sing the songs? <laughs> this was his reply. In regard to taping East-West Gathering, no, I did not record the songs an East-West Gathering sung. What you take me for with my frog's voice? <laughs> Even the speaking voice is not good. I did not do the recording of my own, but as part of my, quote, looking after Harry Kay, close quote, and pleasing him on his last surprise visit. And he is an impossible person to do a job with. He will not wait for the mood of the performer, just sets up, sets up his machine and says, ready! <laughs> <laughs> and won't even play... <laughs> and won't even play back what one does. <laughs> My voice kept breaking down, which <laughs> was a signal for him to leap up with, I'll fix that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fix that in a moment. Seize me and dig his fingers. He was a chiropractor, so he knew all these nerves, <laughs> etc. Dig, <laughs> dig his fingers in into certain nerves until I nearly fainted. <laughs> and then yell, that's better, isn't it? <laughs> oh, God. I should have bought tissues. <laughs> no one will ever know but all of us here have suffered for dear, <laughs> for dear Harry's sake. <laughs> now I'll read this. One of the things that the men Mundley saw, which none of us who met him at Sarvis time, 56, 58, East West Gathering, ever saw any evidence of Barbara's suffering. When he was with you, if he's, the Sarvis is his company, and if he was giving his company, he gave his all. Even if he was very serious, as he was in 58, he still gave that love. He still gave that company. You could feel it. You really felt it. Physically. Now, at the East West Gathering, we were late. The Australians went by boat. The boat got held up and we missed the first day. So on the second day, late in the evening, Barbara made arrangements, apparently. Once I, I, um, I, Ivy Juice, and Barbara had insisted would be the leader of the Sufi. She didn't want the job, but he, want, he asked her to do it. Now her husband worked for Standard Oil 
and therefore had lots of trips to Saudi Arabia. And on one trip, Ivy went with him. And she suddenly realised when she was there, Barbara's only a couple of hours away. So she sent a message, can she come and see Barbara? Barbara said, yes, she could come. She could have five minutes with him and half an hour with the girls. That means the women underneath. Half an hour with the girls. So the Australian women had not met the women Mundali because they were a day late. The women Mundali were behind a screen behind Barbara watching everything that was going on but couldn't be seen. So it was uh, apparently Barbara arranged that those women who hadn't met the women Mundali could go and see the girls. So they went in. Now Lorna was there and she was standing next to Goa. And then the program outside was finished. Barbara walked through the curtain, still that radiant witness, that presence. But the moment he was through the door, it all collapsed. His face, Lorna said, his face went from radiance to, he's into age 10 years, in a second, and his body stopped. Lorna involuntar involuntarily said, or oh, it escaped her. Ah! Oh. Gaba, Goa, grabbed her arm and said, now you've seen it. Every night he comes in, shining like he is outside all afternoon, and then bang, you see, he's utterly exhausted. Now, with the men Mundali, if Baba was suffering because of his universal work, they saw it. He didn't hide it from them. If he was radiant, well, they were lucky. So anyway, this is a letter that Francis wrote. Barbara told us at the beginning of this period, this is October 1959, he would have to go through the slaughterhouse. <coughs> but somehow he seems to have borne it all more lightly. He often sits with us enjoying light chat and humorous bits. In short, enjoying being entertained. At Pune, he lavished love upon us, every day giving us drinks with his own hands and often pieces of cake and such like, which someone coming for his darshan had brought, often taking, it, taking us out visiting homes of his Pune devotees. But he was often very severe and at times grilled one another of us for two or three hours at a time. Back here, that said Mara's ad, he continued to shower us with his love, and even small things bring from him an embrace or a kiss. Yesterday morning, he mentioned you dear ones again, that's the Australians. He has also increased his walking distances. Today, has been like a holiday. Everyone just about doing nothing. <laughs> Tonight is the first night of three days Diwali festival. A festival of the chain of lights. Muchas gracias. Every doorway, windows in India will have a little light made by a wick burning in an open earthenware saucer and on the side of it in honour of Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. Some of you will remember the film The River in villages and towns they were, they were visiting in general hospitality. Tonight the businessman closes the last year's ledger and places the new one at his feet. Here also, admirers said, every doorway has its own little lights and the main entrance is a fairyland. Now it was during this period that one of the Mandali told Francis a, sto a story about Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. The sort of story Francis loved. There was a money lender. And being a money lender, he was an absolute miser. He used to wear old clothes, it didn't matter if they were dirty, worn, 
he was saving his money. And he had a customer, a spendthrift, that he'd lent money to, and he was living the, he was living the good life. And the miser started to get worried about his money. <laughs> this bloke was enjoying too much, and, and he wasn't paying any back. So he decided to go down and see this bloke and get a bit of it back out of him before he spent the lot. So when he went down to the spendthrift's house, some of the tough guys outside wouldn't let him in because he looked like a beggar. Anyway, finally a message went, was taken, reluctantly, to the spendthrift. Who come out. Oh, me old mate, come in. Dragged him in and uh, the bloke tried to keep raising the matter of, you know, <coughs> money that's on loan. No, oh, don't worry about that, don't worry about that. Put on a feast for him, a lavish feast. In the afternoon brought on musicians and dancing girls. And the miser's thinking, you know, all oh, this is, is my money that's being spent. Finally he says, I, I think I'll go home as it's getting dark and he couldn't get anything out of the black. Oh, oh, don't go. No, no, no. There'll be robbers out there. They'll, they'll take all your money. Oh, all right, I better stay then. <laughs> so more feasting went on and he said, you better stay overnight. So he took him into the bedroom. Two beds. Satin sheets, silk pillows, beautiful drapes and that. The moment the spendthrift put his head on the pillow, he was away. The miser lay there thinking, God, oh God, how much money this cost? Oh, he must be spending a fortune. Will I ever get it back? Twelve o'clock, the door opened. A beautiful woman entered, went straight over to the spendthrift bed and started massaging his limbs. And she went on doing this while the miser watched in amazement until dawn. When first light broke, she started to leave. And the miser says, hey, hey, who are you? She says, I'm the goddess of wealth, Lakshmi. He says, why are you, why are you massaging her? I never stop thinking about you. She said, he's my husband, you're my slave. <laughs> Francis love that. <laughs> he writes about his conditions. I have ideal conditions of living and work. I occupy a large room in a line of outbuildings behind the house. This is my reset. Last year, it was occupied by Kaikobad, the old Mandali member, with whom Baba does much work, especially during seclusion periods. But just before we came here, he was sent to Mayrabad for the duration of our stay. There is a window facing east and one west, with a table under each. So I work in the morning at on the west side and in the evening on the east, thus being able at both times to work on the shady side, plus being able to lock the door and take off all my clothes enables me to just manage the heat. I put a sheet of blotting paper under my right arm so that perspiration doesn't wet the writing paper, have a towel handy to mop myself now and then and fire away. No one need ever tell me the advantages of dry heat over wet heat. This is dry heat, so dry that most of the sweat evaporates immediately and it doesn't cool off much before 2 a.m. I have found it quite useless going to bed early, so I generally get in a good spate of work from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. and then I can sleep. Despite this, I don't seem to get much work done being with Baba several hours a day is in itself a day's work, after which one tends to just sit around. I have found the best plan is, after Baba leaves us about 4pm, to lie flat on my back for half an hour, sometimes getting a short sleep, have a bath by standing under a tap, which is on one end of the room, make some tea and then get going. About 7, I take a couple of miles walk, have supper and about nine, as said, settle down to a good, quiet stretch.
God is just to be. That's all. Just to be. I said to Barbara one day, the more I see, the more I wonder why anyone wants God realization. It is a big affair. Barbara's answer, a chuckle and one kiss. The other day, he called me privately to give me a point on a particular piece of work I am doing. His requirement was simple, yet it seemed impossible to execute. Now, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> just previously, he had reprimanded me over something, a piece of bad conduct. His requirement was simple, yet it seemed impossible to execute. Now, he was putting upon me a piece of work which seemed impossible to do. This extraordinary confidence in me, coming on top of my misery because of his rebuke, was too much for me, and I started to weep. Then he asked, what is the matter? And I start mumbling that everything is too much for me. Then he says, <clears throat> don't get discouraged. You are really doing well, and I am satisfied with you. I only said what I did earlier so that your heart would be more comfortable. You see the psychology. You do something wrong, and nothing happens. Barbara doesn't say anything. Oh, I got away with it. The ego's happy, but the heart knows. Huh? Wrap him over the knuckles. knuckles. The ego's not happy, but the heart is more comfortable. Brilliant. So, your heart will be more comfortable. <laughs> Then, then he gives me a kiss, and I go out from him, bursting with gratitude and happiness. <laughs> then he's stuck in a little poem. Verse on how big a God is. If God was the voice within music, he would be easy to sing. One need but listen and utter the note. If he was the glisten of splendor, one could shine and please him, be a mirror reflecting his brightness. If he was the spring of energy, by self-fission, one could storm him with the flame of a question on final issues and arrive and be. <laughs> this God I serve and love is far beyond voices and shinings and questions in the sun. Deaf, blind, aloof to these does not respond, but waits until performances are done. Only the noose of his whim flung in space of heart can catch him to release his grace. Now, one of the things that Barbara used to do was to get the men to do a little play this. This a break from his hard work, you know, universal work. Francis writes, Since the end of October, we have had a series of little plays. Three of these were put on by one Alaba. They were mostly one-man affairs <laughs> with a dialogue <laughs> mostly consisting of the telephone. Conversations or orders barked at an unseen squad. In one, there was a radio broadcast in Hindi, Persian and Arabic announcing war. But to make up for the dearth of dialogue, he constructs the weirdest stage machinery. Suddenly, a globe atlas starts revolving, 
Liquid starts bubbling in a glass jar and the board tips over, revealing a written message on another board and an alarm bell starts ringing. <laughs> and all constructed out of whatever he can find around the house or in the junk heap. And all moving parts are powered by an ordinary clock. <laughs> Mayadas, who when he turned up was Ramdas, but Baba changed that. He was a worker of miracles. He was well known traveling around India and apparently committing the sin of miracles. Mayadas has also staged two or three sketches. He, though, uses a company. He is quite a fine actor himself with a good voice. At present, He's rehearsing a play for Barbara's birthday. Nearly all the men have been roped into it. I was offered a role in one of his previous plays, but couldn't with any hope of accuracy memorise the right words in the right order and of pronouncing them correctly enough. I became terrified at the prospect of an embarrassed audience through misplacing or mispronunciation of words. For as in English, it takes only a slight difference in pronunciation to change an ordinary one into an unmentionable one. <laughs> and so I had to drop out a pity because the role I had was that of the great sage Nar Narada. <laughs> they are all at rehearsals at night in the moonlight. There is no written script. Mayadas makes up the dialogue and teaches it w by word of mouth with accompanying actions at the same time. The story, of course, is from the ancient scriptures, but it will be turned to bring the present avatar, Baba, into it. This is, after all, quite reasonable. There's only ever been one avatar. Baba doesn't mind whether he's been called Baba or Krishna or Ram. He enjoys it all hugely. In fact, Baba has taken a hand in making this up. He has cast Kaka, who is a little fella, and Puka, great bear, in the role of husband and wife. <laughs> Kaka, oh, uh, Puka is the biggest and fattest man of the Mandalay. Poor Kaka, he is 67 years old, has been with Baba through every trial and hardship from the beginning, and now has to start play acting. <laughs> Baba teases them all the time by suggesting situations suitable for the role. <laughs> At one time, Baba was getting Eric to read the newspaper, new stories in the newspaper. And, uh, and, and then he would get the Mandali to act it out. And one story Baba really liked, it was, it was a story of uh, two wedding parties in the same carriage and an argument broke out on which way the fan would be turned. <laughs> there was no, apparently no compromise. And they turned into a, a physical fight when suddenly, according to the newspaper, a young man burst into the carriage waving a revolver and told them if they didn't all shut up he'd shoot the lot of them. <laughs> Oh, Baba loved that and got them in. They had to act it out. And, <laughs> and Baba himself burst into the carriage and waved a gun. And if they didn't all shut up, he'd shoot a lot of them. <laughs> Another thing that Francis used to write to us about was some of the various characters that would turn up. Baba's Dash and A Sanskrit scholar, he's a research scholar, attached to the Deccan College, which Barbara as a youth attended, and which now was a general college, oh, sorry, was then a general uh, college, but now is a language school alone. And he's been coming here regularly. One morning, sitting on the veranda here, he wrote a letter in Sanskrit to a scholar friend in Madras. Before sending it, he showed it to Barbara. It was translated into English by Deshmukh, dear Deshi. And Francis arranged it uh, 
a, li a little bit poetically. And the letter reads, I have had the darshan of Sri Baba of great glory, the most worshipful one, now for a fortnight. Before this, only his name had come to my ears, and I knew nothing of his life story. When I came face to face with the most worshipful barber of ascendant greatness, there arose in my mind an inexpressible joy, the kind of peace which, according to the scriptures, enlivened the forms of Nara, Narayana and others. Exactly that kind of peace is experienced here. One day, when he came into the assembly and sat down, someone <coughs> was reciting in Sanskrit some frivolous verses to Baba. After a few moments, he rose, bowed before Baba and left. The next morning, after greeting Baba, he sat down, as usual, near Baba. Baba asked him why he had left abruptly the previous day. He said uh, that he had some work to do. Baba said, did you feel disturbed because of the recitation? No matter how much one is disturbed, one should try and remain calm. The scholar, no, no, I was not disturbed, nothing like that. I left because I had to bid goodbye to some guests. Baba, did you feel hurt because of the recitation? Did you feel it was an insult to, to Sanskrit? Scholar, I didn't like it. But that was not why I left early. Baba, even if you felt it was an insult to the language, you should not be affected. I am God, and I am insulted every moment. Yet I never fail to respond with love. Scholar, I am trying to learn to tolerate things <laughs> that are not to my taste. Baba then gave him some words of encouragement. Later the scholar said, Ah, Baba must really love me. Otherwise, he would not have taken the trouble to correct me. Another character turned up and Francis wrote, there has been a curious codger coming. He wears the saffron robe of the mendicant, and all over it is printed Sri Mata, Holy Mother. Somehow it tickled my reverence. In other words, some of the larrikin still left in the Australian. <laughs> and I nicknamed him Dear Mum. <laughs> Mm. Now he has gone to Bombay and writes lots of letters. Here he says to me, here's another letter from Mum. <laughs> <laughs> he has developed a burning zeal to go to darkest Africa and convert all of it to Baba. <laughs> Baba looked so innocently relieved and said to Eric, Encourage him to do that. <laughs> now, one of the things that Francis, that some people not used to him, might say, "Oh, you know, he 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 he's cranky." Well, he could be, but he was also thoughtful. Once in the early days of Sydney. Something happened that upset Francis. He wasn't very happy. And um, there's some trivial thing occurred. It might have been making a cup of tea or something. Lorna made the cup of tea. And Francis was, was being upset and cranky. And, and, and he had a go at Lorna over this thing. And Lorna regarded that as unjust. And a strong sense of justice. One of the things that happened with Lorna when we first started meeting Francis was the fact 
But when she was 14, she was going, she believed in Jesus, she believed in the Bible, and she went to church every Sunday, St. Stephen's Anglican. It's on Broadway between the railway and the university. And she was 14, and uh, the minister had given a sermon, and a, a 14 year old, she, she detected there was something wrong, there was a contradiction. So when she came out of church, she asked the minister, you know, what exactly it meant. He just wiped her and said, oh, you wouldn't understand. And then we met Francis, and she asked questions. You might not agree that Francis was right, but he would give you an answer. And that's, you know, that was part of our relationship with Francis. And he might get upset about certain things, but they're always from the point of view. Oh, with regard to that business with Lorna, uh, she told him he was a cranky bugger. <laughs> he stopped and he thought about it. For the rest of the day, he was very loving to not only Lorna but everyone because he realised what she said was right. He didn't make, make apology, but he, he made verbally been made an apology by his actions for the rest of the day. And so when, Barbara take, uh, when Francis takes up some theme, it's always because somehow what the person is doing or saying is leading them away from a clear understanding of Barbara's message. So once he let fly in a general letter to all the Australian group, Note on Barber's conversational talk. Since Avatar is the axis of the universe and of every individual particle of it, no word or gesture of his can be without the profoundest significance. As the poet said, speaking of a perfect master of his time, ah, this sudden upheaval of the earth and sky, it is because the master has turned on his side. Notwithstanding, it is absurd for us to try and read significances and inner meanings into Barber's simple actions and general talk. There is no means whereby it could be correct. The only intelligent reaction to the rain god wants me to suffer more yet would be the parrots, the rain god, etc., etc. I remember one day at the 1955 service, Baba was walking up and down the meeting hall after lunch. Naturally, a number of Savasis gathered in the doorways and watched him. Afterwards, Baba said, When I was walking up and down, some of you were thinking, Baba is doing his universal work. But as a matter of fact, I was simply digesting my lunch. <laughs> The point is, <coughs> since there is no time when Barbara is not engaged on his uniform work, why single out some isolated individual action as being linked with it? It is nothing more than an expression of, we are in the know, we are a little bit more on the inside. The same applies to statements that one has heard or read that Barbara was working through someone, or using such and such a situation to further his work, or that during his travels he was laying cables. Since Avatar has said is the access of all things, and since his mission is universal, there could be no one and no insect through whom and with which he is not working, and no situation which he has not created, let alone using. As for cable laying, well, I suppose one person's fancy is as good as another's. <laughs> and another situation this would occur, and I can remember going through this particular phase, it was very common, it became a real buzzword. But last year, we had a change of divine agency. From Baba doing this or that, it became the workings of Maya, or Maya's hand, that was in everything. 
When someone missed a train connection or a plane was late or he couldn't get on it, it was Maya's doing. If someone caught a cold or had a toothache, it was Maya's doing. In some instances, it was Maya trying to cause the person to lose their hold on Baba's Dharman. No one ever said that the promotion or salary raise they got or the pleasant evening that they had had was Maya. Not the nice things, <laughs> only the unpleasant and uncomfortable things were Maya. The correct definition of Maya is, quote, the principle of ignorance, close quote. That simply and uncomfortably means that every action one does, every breath one draws, is nothing but Maya, right up to and including the sixth blooming plane. Poor Baba. Poor dear beloved Baba has been saying this over and over and over now for 40 years. <laughs> no wonder he suffers. I mentioned that um, he's writing long poems, 1959, 1960, and then he started developing, or he developed, an English version of the Guzzles. So, these long poems he'd been working on, he set them aside. And uh, concentrated on writing guzzles. <coughs> and in 1965, he wrote us, uh, well, uh, it might have started in 64, he then went back to the five long poems and worked on them. Word at World's End, yes. <coughs> and he wrote us in January 65 about this book of five sections. He called it then Song at World's End. And it was later changed it to the Word at World's End. And he writes that this book comes before In Dust I Sing, which he... Uh, uh, he wrote to us about, I think I must have that somewhere. Bio <laughs> no, Barber. <laughs> His will. There, were, there was a bloke who was coming to Barber and he was just one amongst the Mundali. And Barber had given him things to do. And when he would turn up, Barbara would say, Did you, oh no, I, I disobeyed you, Barbara. Well, I think it was a way of getting attention. He was a nobody amongst famous people in Mundali because he kept disobeying Barbara and Barbara would have to correct him and wag, wag his finger. One day, he wanted to ask Barbara why he continued to disobey Barbara. But he wasn't game enough to ask Barbara himself. So he asked Padre to ask Barbara for him. So... When one day when Padre's with Barbara, he said, he said that this, this fellow wants to know why he keeps disobeying Barbara. Barbara said, tell that idiot it's because of my will. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Francis started writing Guzzles in 1961. And then it got to 1964 and he wrote a letter to us in February 64, a week before Barbara's birthday. Now, a couple of weeks before that, Lorna had sent a letter, written a letter to Francis, in which she used the phrase singing dust. If we didn't know the title of this book, In Dust I Sing. Right? We'd never heard it, what the title was of the guzzles. And Francis wrote, so Francis wrote this letter. Dear Robert and Lorna, I know that you'll be glad to know that I will be placing at our beloved Barber's feet on his birthday a new book, In Dust I Sing. 150 14-line poems in rhyming couplets 
in a new form, being a cross between the sonnet and the Persian guzzle, which half is used. For the last six weeks I've been toiling till one or two o'clock in the morning every night, improving the draft and writing a fair copy. Now it is ready. Then, where did Lorna in the last letter get hold of the phrase singing dust? <laughs> now Francis had based his uh, guzzle form there, there was a, uh, the sonnet was originally in the Italian form, and there are English versions of it. But France, uh, Shakespeare changed that by changing the rhyming scheme and ending up with a sonnet form that ended in a rhyming couplet. And that was the clue to Francis for an English guzzle. Seven couplets of rhyming couplets. Now, when Francis came here, he, he'd found this property, gone back to Sydney, and when he came here, prepared for a long stay to get the place ready for Barber. As far as I know, he only brought one book with him, a book of Shakespeare's sonnets. Now, the house that was where the Rose Garden is now had to be shifted down there. And uh, in order to shift the house, he found out there was a, House shifter. His name was Neby. He came from Gainda, which is about 50 kilometres northwest of here, Mandarin country. But he found out Neby was working, doing a job at Kabulcha. So he contacted him there, and he came from there to Avatar's abode to move the house, which is a big job. You know, it takes weeks of work. Particularly as during the month he was here, it rained 30 inches during the month of April. So the house has to be jacked up on railway lines, the stumps dug out, holes dug for the, dug for the stumps in a new position. And of course, they promptly filled up with rain, <laughs> and they had to be bailed out, and then it rained again <laughs> before they get the stumps there. It's a long job. So Neby, and he had a 21-year-old uh, helper, and uh, the helper was 21, and, and, and we knew he had a girlfriend up at Gainda. And of course, they were due to go from Kabulcha back to Gainda, but they came here. You know, one night after everyone was digesting Lorna's meal, she cooked for the, for the mob, and everyone was, well, it was exhausting, it's hard work. They were, they were, you know, day after day, six days a week. So Francis entertained them all, including Nebi and the young fella, by reading one of Shakespeare's, oh, by reading some of Shakespeare's sonnets. And he started with the sonnet that begins, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? By the time he was halfway through the sonnet, <laughs> the young fella, he was missing his very own summer's day. <laughs> Then in, that was in 64, he presented that book to Barber. And uh, he was going to present Song at World's End to Barber in Barber's birthday, 65. So he explains that this book comes before in dust. One of the sections remains yet to be retyped. I will try and get a copy to you by the 1st of the 1st, 1970. Uh, no, that's uh, May, yes, so it's 64. No, it must be 71. Whatever. <laughs> so you can start reading it on that date. Uh, its general reading can be at the next anniversary. I should uh, keep in mind, uh, I had it in mind to present it to beloved Barber on his birthday. But since this book is in a very modern idiom, I didn't know whether Barber would really like it. So I read it to him, and he enjoyed it very much. Now I have nothing for his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I should have finished with something dramatic, like talking about Maya. So I'll have to end limply with Joe Barber. <laughs>